thank you all that are at home um, joining us from there. And we are just so excited to be here and actually be to the end of our seven-week overview of the Bible. Um, it's been kind of a cool ride, and we're going to show you, you know, we talk about the apocalypse. I don't look up video clips, but this, we got one that's a little bit not as weird, so... Time's up. That was the mildest one I could find. Um, <laughs> it's from Independence Day. Um, but when you look up that, if you talk, think about Armageddon, the apocalypse, uh, the end of the world. It is, you know, everybody's got a different idea and a, they're really black and bleak. Today is the end of our, in reality, there is an end to life as we know it. And we're going to be talking about that a little bit today. I mean, there is, I mean, you could go on a whole year of messages about that. We're just going to sum it up in, in today's message. The Bible has an ending, but it is a happy ending for those that believe. And for those that are followers of Christ, God made it possible for everybody to get there, to get to heaven. He sent his son, Jesus Christ. Remember John 3:16. Can any of you say it with me? For God so loved the world. What did he love? The world, the entire world, not just bits and pieces. He loved the world and he sent his one and only son that whosoever believes in him will not die but have everlasting life. We can all get there. It's, it, there it, there's a way to go and there's a way to get our everlasting life. That is a possibility to, for everybody's story to end that way. So as we conclude our overview of the Bible, we are drawn to the end of the book of God's Word, the book of Revelations. Turn with me to Revelation 21, 5 through 8. It's very, like I said, it's the last book, so it isn't hard to find if you have your own Bibles. Otherwise, it'll be up on the screen for you. And it says, And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life. All who are victorious will inherit all these blessings, and I will be their God, and they will be my people, my children. But cowards, unbelievers, corrupt, murderers, the immoral, those who practice witchcraft, idol worshipers, and all liars, their fate is in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is a second death. How will your story end? Jesus told John, it's the end of time, the world, it is finished. This is the end of our story. To all that are thirsty, and with, there will be blessings. They will be my children. To those who have believed on me, I have a place for you. But to those who continue to choose their own way, their fate is the fiery lake of burning, fi burning sulfur, hell. There are those that think that there isn't any hell. They think that it's just kind of something God put in there to scare us. It's um, wishful thinking that, I mean, they think, it isn't wishful thinking, it's wishful thinking to think that everybody's going to get to heaven. Because that's all it is. It's called universalism. And it's, you can choose to put your hope in that, but wishful thinking doesn't get you to heaven. You can choose, but it's, you know, it sounds kind of good. You want, you know, you want everybody you know to get to heaven, right? I mean, that's what we long for, and we think, well, you know, everybody gets there. You know, there's more good in them than bad. They're going to balance it out. Well, that isn't what the Bible says. That isn't what Jesus said. Jesus said that hell is a real place. He spoke of hell at least eight times in the Gospel of Matthew alone, of being a real place where real people choose to go. Now, if you choose to believe that there isn't any hell, 
you choose to believe that when the Bible references it, that it's not true. It's just like going to those pages in Revelation and just tearing them out. If I can do that, like that. And then if you do that, then you have to remember John wrote the book of Revelation. So you got to take out that section. You got to take out the book of John, because if you can't trust John and Revelation, how can you trust him for writing the book of John and the book of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John? And then it's mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because we just said Jesus mentioned hell three times. So, I mean, you can't believe that in those Gospels. And then, you know, the Old Testament talks about hell all the time. So you got to tear out that. And so if you're tearing out all the pages, there ain't going to be a lot of your book left. And then if you only like the parts that you like, why is the Bible even relevant at all for today? Why do we bother? Can, you know, can we really pick and choose those books, those, you know, the parts of the Bible that we want to believe? I mean, that, you know, it's all put there for a purpose. Isaiah wrote, but those who die in the Lord will live. Their bodies will rise again. And those who sleep in the earth will rise up again and sing for joy. For your life, giving life, will fall like dew on your people in the place of the dead. So if we rip all that out, if we rip out all the references to the Bible, then we're basically saying God's word isn't true. And that means the good parts aren't any truer than the, the other parts we don't like. We can't choose to only believe certain parts of the Bible and ignore the rest. The entire Bible, it says in 2 Timothy 3.16, is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we're wrong and teaches us to do what is right. And in Matthew 5.18, it says, For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter nor the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. God's word doesn't change. It is always true. It is all written out from Genesis to Revelation. We've spent the last six weeks sharing God's love from beginning until today, the end of the story. And just for those of you, I didn't really tear up a Bible. I tore up a two book, two dollar book. So um, <laughs> I couldn't have tore up a Bible. I was taught not to do things like that. So. <laughs> There's my Bible. Um, <laughs> so, but we're going to look at, let's do an overview. We have our triangle coming up there again. We have that old contract, right? And we have the new contract on the other side. The old contract, it starts with the holy God and righteous man. And then we have Satan and sin entered into our lives, and it destroyed everything that God really created. From Genesis 1 through chapter Ge Genesis 11, God had a case against us. God has a case against us. He, he, he destroyed and he judged the world. And then there was the 12 tribes of Israel. And well, frat the one world government in there first. There was a 12 tribe. Then we have the one world government. I'm trying to do this from memory because I can't see that. Um, <laughs> so we have the one world government. And then everybody's dispersed to go all over the world. And then out of that comes Abraham. And Abraham is told, you are a great nation, you will form a great land, and out of you will come a great Messiah. And out of those will be those 12 tribes of Israel. And they go to Egypt, they come back, and they, fall, they go to the promised land, and out of those 12 tribes of Israel comes Jesus, the Messiah, the promise. His story is found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then Jesus came to be the perfect sacrificial lamb to take our place he laid his life on the table, on the altar. And then he called into these 12 men and he built into these 12 disciples and they became the beginnings of the church, which we learned about last week. And to be part of that church, we need to repent and be baptized. Then we become an all new community and we have an all new code to live by and we have an all new cause as we learned last week. In the future, there will again be a one world government, followed by the world being judged and destroyed. Then Satan and sin will exit, and we conclude with God and redeemed man, finishing up the promise and the Bible and the book of Revelation, which we're going to be looking at this morning. We certainly could go on and on about the end times. I mean, there's tons of places we could go into this. But like I said, we're doing an overview. We don't want to be here all day. And even then, we would never cover it all. There's just so much. But did you know that the end of, day, uh, end of the world has been forecasted like lots and lots of times? I couldn't even tell you how many, but I found the top 10. 
So we're gonna kinda do the Letterman's top 10 tonight, <laughs> this morning. So we're gonna start with number 10. We're gonna start with the Mayan calendar. How many of you remember that? I remember that was just a few years ago in 2012. Our youth group was all worried at Austin. The end of the world's coming on December 21st. I thought, what? Um, so, and it was because the Mayan calendar's great cycle ended on, May, on December 21st, 2012. Even one guy built a modern day Noah's Ark in China to, to survive the end, of the end of the world. Number nine is Harold Camping. He publicly predicted the end of the world at least 12 times. He wasn't very good at it. Um, in 1992, he predicted the end of the world would be in 1994, and they wrote a book about it, and they did a movie called 1994. Guess what? We are still here. And then on May 21st, 2011, he did it again. And then uh, that year, he said, oh, I got the numbers wrong. It's especially October 21st, 2011. Okay, number eight was the Taiwan, from, uh, from Taiwan, and it was called The True Way. God would appear on the U.S. television channel 18 on March 25th, 1988. So, and then in 19, what's the next one? Haley's Comet. You know, it goes by every 76 years. In 1910, it got so close to the earth that the people feared that that would be the end of our planet. So Haley's Comet. Number six is Millerism. Religious leader William Miller began preaching in 1831 that the end of the world as we know it would occur with the second coming of Christ in 1843. Joanna Southcart predicted she would give birth to the second Messiah when she was 64. She died before it happened, so, in 1814. In 1806, there was a domesticated hen in, Leed, in Leeds, England, and they thought that's, they, she was predicting the end of the world because she was laying eggs that had the message inscribed on it that said, Christ is coming. Came to, came to find out that the owner of the hen was inscribing those eggs and reinserting them in the poor hen. And so people have done odd things. Number three, the great fire of London in 1666. Because the Bible calls 666 the end of the, the number of the beast, many Christians in 17th century Europe feared that the end of the world would be in 1666. The great London fire, which lasted from September 2nd to September 5th of that year, destroyed much of the city, including 87 churches and 13,000 homes. Many saw it as a fulfillment of the end of the world prophecy, but only 10 people died. So it wasn't quite the end of the world. And then our, our last one, no, not the last one, Johann Stoffler, second to last one. German mathematician and astrologer predicted that a great flood would cover the world on February 25th, 1524. I guess he forgot to read Genesis 6, where God said he would never send another flood. So, um, and then the last one is Montanism, a second century schismatic movement of Christianity that began in Phygria, modern Turkey. And based on his visions, he claimed to speak under the influence of the spirit. They believed that the second coming of Christ was imminent in the second century. So the end of the world is not a new theme. It is not a new interest, and it has captured the imagination of films and people and so-called prophets for centuries. If you read Revelations and Daniel and Ezekiel, we know that there will be an end of the world. We know that the forming of the church precedes the end time events. We know that Jesus came down from heaven, and I'm going to try to do a drawing here. I'm, I'm a terrible artist, so... Isn't, I'm not trying to be artistic anyway. But um, so Jesus, we know that he came down. He came down to earth. And then uh, we know he was born. And then we know that he died. And then we know he eventually went back up into heaven. He ascended into heaven. And in the meantime, he left the 12 disciples to start the church. And then we know he's coming back again. And he's going to, and on that day, he's going to, they're going to have if a throne of judgment. All that is written throughout the prophecies. And you know, there's, and there's a lot of confusion and a lot of discussion. Is the end of the world going to be like, and the church is going to leave? And we don't know if it's going to leave during the pre-trib, mid-trib, or after, post-trib. 
And you know what? We're not even going to talk about those other than just mention them because those would take mess a whole series of messages all by themselves. And I'm just hoping that I'll be out of here before any of that happens. Because at the end of the world, the end times, when you read them in Revelations, are, are very unpleasant. It's not a good, you know, all those movies have a lot of element of truth to them. That's why they're so horrid. Because when, when the church leaves the world, it's going to be a lawful, terrible place. So those are the things. But what we're, gonna po what we're really going to concentrate on today are three key things that we will see the end of totally, completely. First, there will be the end to all faults, to all falsehood. There will be an end to Satan, the father of lies. John 8, says, For you are children of your father, the devil, and you love to do evil things he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. He has always hated the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So Satan is a liar. He is the father of all lies, all fault. He is going to leave. He is going to be placed into the lake of fire once and for all. But first, we're going to see that one world government be formed. For those of us in the United States, this used to be something that we thought would never happen. That there would never be a possibility of a one world. I mean, we like our country. We're very patriotic. We're all those things. But, you know, uh, the culture and our times have shifted, and the possibility actually looms ahead of us. On June 21st, just this year, there was a march on Washington, D.C. for a one-world government. And it happened in nine other cities on that day. And actually, there, it was supposed to be during the solar eclipse, and the marches are, it were intended to create chaos. Isn't that a wonderful thing somebody thought to do? Let's hear what some other people on the streets of New York City said in 2011 regarding the possibility of a one world government. Absolutely. Because it's a, it's a global planet. I mean, there's no more. We all know where we all live and we all know what's going on. And everyone can reach out and touch a computer and reach out and touch someone somewhere else. I.e., it's, it's I'm, I live on planet Earth. I, I don't know where you're from. That's, and that's kind of the way it is, you know. It, it is what it is. It's not, I don't, I don't see it as, uh, I mean, as I am an American, but how do I word it? Uh, it's a global community and it's a global community for kids, especially like from the ground up. They know where everything is. It's no more America versus future found America. We all know where other countries are. We all know what's going on. You can find out what's going on at the drop of a hat. And the second that someone does something wrong or bad or something bad happens, the rest of the world knows about it and can react on it. Um, like instantly, within hours. I would never, it was never like that before. And that makes us global. So, global is global. I, I don't know. I kind of, I like having the variety. I guess there's no ideal government or there's no way to make it ideal because I guess communism, the idea of everything being equal for everybody is awesome, but obviously it doesn't work. So, um, I don't know. Like other countries, like have socialism and democracy. I think that it's good to have those different kinds types to like feed off of on and develop your own to make it the best it can be. No, no, it would hard. Uh, you cannot consider <laughs> because of the same principles of democracy. You cannot have. Uh, widespread spread, spread democracy because there's no single person that cannot can determine what's good for everyone so uh, if you go wider that you have so many individual uh, goals and perceptions that you cannot uh, set a, a, a rule that applies for everyone I don't think so I don't think I think that's putting the power too high up you know like, I don't think any organization should have that much power over so many people and I have so many like so many just be like a huge tidal wave effect I think having countries that have like their own sovereignty is perfectly fine so there's people thinking about it there's the possibility people considering it I want you to read with me from Revelation 13 and it's like I said it's the last book of the Bible if you've used your Bibles this morning otherwise it'll be on the screen 
Then I saw another beast come up out of the earth, and he had two horns like those of the lamb. But he spoke with the voice of a dragon, and he exercised all the authority of the first beast. And he required all the earth and its people to worship the first beast, who fateful wound had been healed. He did astounding miracles, even making fire flash down to earth from the sky while everyone was watching. And with all the miracles he was allowed to perform on behalf of the first beast, he deceived all the people who belonged to this world. He ordered the people to make a great statue of the first beast who was fatally wounded and then came back to life. He was then permitted to give life to this statue so that it could speak. Then the statue of the beast commanded that anyone refusing to worship it must die. He required everyone, small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to be given a mark on the right hand or on their forehead. And no one could buy or sell anything without that mark, which is either the name of the beast or the number representing his name. Number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. There There will be a one world government eventually near the end of our world. He will be the master deceiver. He will, they, he will be allowed to do so many miracles that the people, even though all those that are on the world, in the world at that time, will fall for him. They will be deceived. He will deceive all the people that belong to this world that do not know Jesus Christ. At the end of all, all of this, falsehood will be destroyed. Peter wrote, and um, he wrote, they deliberately forget that God made the heavens long ago by the word of his command. And he brought the earth out of the water and surrounded it with water. Then he used the water to destroy the ancient world with a mighty flood. And by the same word, the present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire. They are being kept for the day of judgment when ungodly people will be destroyed. The present heavens and earth have been stored up for fire, kept for the day of judgment. Why has he taken so long? Why has God allowed so much bad stuff to continue to happen? Why has he allowed the world to get in such a mess that it's in already? Well, if you go on with 1 Peter, he kind of help, he tells us why. He continues in verse 8. But you must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. But the day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise, and the very elements themselves will disappear in fire, and the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. God isn't willing that anyone should perish. He is patient in allowing us all to have a choice. He has given us a choice. Hell was not created for humankind. It was was created for Satan. In Revelation again, it says, Then the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the fiery lake of the burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. That's whom hell was created for. Satan and sin will exit once for all time. The one world government will end, and the world will be judged, destroyed, and then Satan and sin will exit. Then there will be the second end, the end of faith. Now that sounds kind of weird. Sounds kind of crazy. We've heard all these last few weeks that it is through faith that we have been saved, not through our works, lest any man should boast. We know that we have to have faith to believe, in Romans 1, 17, it says the good news tells us that God made us right in his sight, and this is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Paul used that phrase 14 times in the book of Romans, we are saved by faith. And that's what those of us that, that are familiar with Martin Luther, that's what, share, that's what turned him around. He read in Romans that he was saved by faith. And that's what he put up on the, on the door of the church, those 90 theses, if I'm saying that right. And he nailed them up there. And the premise was to, the, to help the Catholic church to get, to get together and you know, to remember that we are saved by faith alone. So why am I saying that it'll be the end of our faith? Why it will be the end of faith? 
Well, as 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says, it says, now we see things imperfectly, like puzzling reflections in a mirror, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. All that I know is partial and complete and incomplete, but then I will know everything completely, just as God now knows me completely. Once we get to the end of our, when we get to heaven, we don't need faith anymore. We see Jesus, we see God, we are there. We don't have to have faith in him. We, we, we're already there. We, we can let go, I mean, we can see the things, everything, we can see everything perfectly and completely. That sounds pretty cool. We don't have to depend on ourselves anymore. We depend on God alone, as we always do. As we go back to Revelation 20, I want to look at verse 11. It says, And I saw a great white throne, and the one sitting on it, the earth and the sky fled from his presence, and they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were open, including the book of life, and the dead were judged according to what they had done, as re recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire, this lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not formed, found, recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. So I want to go back to our picture over here. All right, it said that, you know, we come to this throne judgment and there's going to be two options. We're all going to stand there and we're going to come before God and we're going to, our name has to be found in the Lamb's book of life. Well, to be in that Lamb's book of life is when we ask Jesus to come into our hearts, when we admit that he's a savior, when we've confessed our sins and repented, that's how our name gets into that Lamb's book of life. We choose, we have chosen. So we stand in front of him, we are judged according to everything we have done. If we have, if we have chosen to go our own way, <clears throat> if we have chosen to disregard God's word to say, no, I don't believe you're real. I'm not going to follow you. He's going to send us to hell. If we've chosen to follow him, if our, if, we're, if our name is found in the Lamb's book of life, we're going to heaven. We're going to be with him forever. There is no, there's no middle. There's only heaven or hell. It's our choice. All people will stand before this throne, everybody, past and present. C.S. Lewis wrote in the, in the book, The Problem of Pain, in the long run, the answer to all those who object to the doctrine of hell is in itself a question. What are you asking God to do? To wipe out their past sins and at all costs to give them a fresh start, smoothing every difficulty, <clears throat> excuse me, and offering every miraculous help? But he has done so at Calvary. He's done it. He's made it. He's made a way to forgive them. And he says to forgive them? Well, they will not be forgiven. To leave them alone? Alas, I'm afraid that is what he does. Hell is real. We choose it. God didn't. Anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. But for those that are believers, their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And Jesus, the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world, there will be the final end. The end of futile. The world as we know it will be gone. All futility, all the sin, all the pain, all the parts of our world that are such a mess. It will be over once and for all, sin and death. As we read about that new heaven and new earth in Revelation 21, 1 to 7, and 22 through 27, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw a holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, Look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone forever. And the one sitting on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. And then he said to me, Write this down, for what I tell you is trustworthy and true. And he also said, It is finished. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will give freely from the springs of the water of life, and all who are victorious will inherit all these blessings. And I will be their God, and they will be my children. Down to tw verse 22. I saw no temple in the city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city had no need of the sun or the moon, for the glory of God illuminates the city, and the Lamb is its light. The nations will walk in its light, and the kings of the world will enter the city in all their glory. Its gates will never be closed at the end of the day, because there is no night there. And all the nations will bring their glory and honor to the city. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry and dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. It is no secret. God has made a way. He's made it plain in his word. He has made it ready for everybody. It's here in the Bible. Almost 14 years ago, a little boy, he was four years old, had a glimpse of heaven. And his father, a Wesleyan pastor from Imperial, Nebraska, wrote a book called Heaven is Real. And there was a movie that was on it, about it. Um, we actually showed it here quite a while back. But I want to show a video clip from that, from his interview on the Today Show, a little bit about what he saw when he went to heaven. Vivid are your memories today. Can you still close your eyes and remember exactly what you think heaven looked like, exactly what Jesus looked like, all those things? Well, I remember most of it, but since time has come by, you forget. And when you say nobody in, in heaven is old, um, they all, I mean, not, you saw nobody like in their 60s, 70s, 80s up there? No, saw them in their. 20s, 30s at oldest. I, I think a question a lot of people would like to ask you, Colton, is what did heaven itself look like? I mean, is it the way I talk it, about it to my kids? Is it above the clouds? Is everybody float? What's it like? Well, there's a, va there's a lot of colors. There are a lot of people and a lot of animals. So here we are. For those of us that believe in Jesus Christ, heaven is waiting. It is a real place. It is real. But you have a choice to believe it or not. This series wove together God's story for us all. And it begs the question today, where are you putting your faith? Is it in our government? Is it in wishful thinking? Is it in science? Or is it in the Lamb of God? We've asked this a few times in the last few weeks. God gives each of us a choice. I'm going to have, the, have Laura come up and, and Noah, there because I'd like them to play a little bit in the background. But um, for anybody that hasn't made that choice today, that isn't sure if their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, I would ask that you pray with us this morning. And I want to give you some time to just think about it and to pray about it. Um, because heaven is for real, but so is, so is hell. Yeah. Um, there are people crazy, that we yeah. know that we love very much. Maybe you just want to be praying for somebody that you love a great deal that doesn't know Jesus really Christ this morning. And you want to pray that God will give you yeah. an opportunity to share that truth with them. Because God says to share, our truth, share the truth, but share it in love. Don't beat them over the head with just, it. Don't say, well, if you don't do this today, you're going to die. Don't do that. But love them. Share with them the truth. Share them how much God loves them. God isn't willing that any should perish. I don't know how I can share that any more passionately. But we want each one to, we want everybody we know to go to heaven. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He's made the way. He paid the price. He did all the work. All he is asking us to say is yes, to surrender our will to his. Over the last few weeks, I've asked, hope, hope you've had time to seriously consider what you've already placed your faith in. I want you, you to prayfully consider where your faith is today. Is it a growing faith? Are you barely gonna make it? Are you ready for the future gut judgment? Where will you go? If you aren't sure, and if you wanna be sure, I ask you to pray with me, and I, want you, I ask you to repent of your sins and to believe on Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. If you haven't taken that next step of baptism, we're having a baptism in a couple of weeks on November 15th, and you can certainly get signed up for that. Um, I know we have 
two people already, and I think we have another one as well. So if you have not taken that step of obedience, um, it's a great time today th to let me know today. I'd like you to pray with me now. Dear Lord, it's a, it's a heavy subject, but it's also an exciting, glorious subject to know that one day we will be in heaven with you forever. Forever is a really long time. This, worth, this time on this world is so, so short compared to eternity. And it's hard for us to grasp, God. But for those of us that have endured pain and problems and death in our, in our families and stuff, to know that there will be no more death, no more crying, no more tears, no more pain. Oh, heaven sounds like is a glorious place to go. And Father, you have made the way. And Lord, for those today that are making that decision, that want to choose to follow you or have not chosen yet, I pray, Lord, today will be the day that they will say, yes, Lord. Dear Father, we repent. I repent of my sins. I come to you, and, and there are days where I come, I just, I blow it, and I am so sorry, and I'm so thankful that you have forgiven me, and that you have shown me the way to go, and that you've redirected my life. And I thank you for your forgiveness. I thank you that you have paid the price. I thank you that I can know my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And I pray today for anyone here today that feels that, that is turning their hearts to you, that they will do that today. They will say yes and surrender their will to yours. Lord, we ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.